30-year-old intimacy therapist Peter Newman's world turns upside down after removing a benign brain tumor, a movie based on a true story of a man hitting puberty at 30 years of age. We get to see the protagonist Peter in the opening scene. He is a 30-year-old handsome man, who is known for being kind and soft. Perhaps, that might be one of the reasons people think he's a homosexual, apart from not being with any women ever. Being the handsome man he is, girls often throw themselves at him, as we see in the opening scene. Peter is in a session with the patient but she keeps making inappropriate comments about how she wants to be with him. Despite the woman being gorgeous, Peter keeps it professional and tries to explain to her that she's dealing with OSD obsessive intimate desires. With that, we learn that Peter has written a book about intimate desires and recommends it to the young woman while claiming that it will change her life. Despite motivating the young woman to give his book a chance, she makes another inappropriate comment once again, so Peter realizes that he has a lot to work with. After finishing work, he sits in his office trying to come up with some chapter topics for his new book. Getting his sound recorder, he turns it on and starts brainstorming. One of the chapters is how important is intimacy to being a man. What's more important in a man, the mental or the physical? And can you be an adult without experiencing intimacy? Pulling into the parking garage, he records the final chapter Can a person be truly happy without intimacy? Getting into the building, he is stopped by one of the neighbor's kids. A tall chubby teenager named Josh is having some girl problems and he asks Pete for some advice. He had asked a girl out but she had come with another boy who she got intimate with in front of Josh. Pete assures him that there's nothing to worry about as there are other fish in the sea. Getting into the apartment, he hears some noises and gets concerned but soon realizes that his friends have let themselves in. He reminds them that the key he gave them was just for emergencies, assuming that they've only come over to hang out, but they let them know that there is an emergency. His friends are the perfect representation of dumb and dumber as they say the most outrageous things without making any sense. Rich is married and has two kids, his emergency is wanting to escape his kids as he thinks that they have nothing in common. Luke is a recently single guy who hides from his former girlfriend while she's taking all of her stuff from his apartment. Pete gets concerned and asks Luke how he's doing, but he tells him that he's fine as he swipes right on some girl on Tinder. Luke, being excited about getting into the dating world, claims that dating is so much easier, and even suggests that he makes an account for Pete. Not wanting to entertain their nonsense, Pete gets up to grab wine from the fridge to take it to Michelle's. She is his next-door neighbor and she's throwing a party to introduce her dishes to her closest people as she wants to open a restaurant. Rich tries to convince Pete to take him to the party but Pete claims that he doesn't want to help him cheat, despite Rich claiming to only flirt with them. He asks Luke, but he claims that he has to beat the Tinder high score of sleeping with the most women from the app. Rich and Luke get into a discussion about how important it is for Luke to beat that record, so Pete leaves, not wanting to entertain the conversation. Knocking on the door, he is greeted by Nikki. She is an attractive young woman with the cutest curls and is Michelle's best friend. Annoyed, she asks Pete why he hasn't brought a single friend with him, so Pete tells her what their situation is like. After talking to Nikki, Pete heads to the living room where he sees Charlie, Michelle's boyfriend. Charlie is a handsome young man with sharp features and dreamy eyes. He is talking on the phone or rather yelling at someone work-related. After getting off his second phone, he asks Pete what he wants so Pete reminds him that he is Michelle's neighbor. Charlie puts his hand out, but Pete reminds him that they have previously met. Not acknowledging the fact, Charlie continues with his calls as he gets bombarded with them. Going into the kitchen, he is met with Michelle preparing some food for everyone. He hands her the wine and goes to pour himself a glass when she asks him to try one of her dishes. Chili and Nagata is what he tries and claims that it's the best thing his taste buds have ever experienced. She's not sure she's ready to become a chef but he assures her that she is and promises to help her with the music. They make jokes and laugh around, so Michelle punches his arm jokingly. Wincing from pain, Pete stops and holds his head. Michelle claims that she didn't hit him that hard, but Pete complains about feeling a sharp pain in his head. As they're talking, Charlie gets into the kitchen, and the atmosphere changes. He apologizes to Michelle for being on his phone all the time but promises not to look at his phone anymore as he puts it on mute. Surprised, Michelle raises her brows as she can't believe what she's seeing. Unfortunately, a ringtone can be heard and it's Charlie's second phone. After the party, Pete lies in bed thinking of his problems, therefore, thinking of new chapter topics. One comes to his mind, can there be romantic love without intimacy? The next morning, he decides to visit his parents James and Brenda. His mother greets him at the door with a box of brownies. Sitting down, he is bombarded with his mother's stories related to his job, and with his father's disapproval of what he does. Brenda asks him whether he's staying for dinner and he says that he can't because he has plans for the evening. His mother thinks that he's going on a date and asks him whether he's meeting with a woman. But instead of answering, he gets up to leave. Closing the door, Brenda asks James why he's being so negative, instead of accepting what his son does. James admits to not knowing who his son is, it isn't the man he raised him to be. It is ironic to write a book about intimacy when you've never had a girlfriend according to James. Nothing makes sense to James as he can't even tell what his son is. Pete is in shock as his boss tells him that he has been invited to do a Ned talk. 
However, there's even better news for Pete. He has been invited to do an interview with Norma Wilcoxon on the NPR interviews. Pete starts freaking out and fangirling over Norma. He thanks his boss for everything that she's done for him and promises to do even better. Returning from work, he hears some yelling in the hallway. Getting closer to his door, he sees Michelle kicking Charlie out of her apartment as she claims that she never wants to see him again. Pete stops to observe the situation, so Charlie turns to him. He lets out a snarky comment about women being women, but before he leaves he tells Pete that he is lucky to be dating men, despite Pete being into women. Wanting to see whether Michelle's right, Pete knows on her door and he is met with a teary-eyed Michelle. They hug and head over to the kitchen to get some wine. Tears still fall down her cheeks, and she admits to not feeling loved by Charlie, which is the reason she broke up with him. According to her, it's not what love is supposed to feel like. Genuinely curious, Pete asks her what love feels like but she assumes that he knows. She admits that she feels alone and is tired of not being a priority. Sitting down on the couch, Pete gets honest with Michelle. He does think that Charlie loves her but in his way, he claims that Michelle is not a difficult person so if he's making her feel like she's unnecessary, it's not worth it. His words make her realize that the only thing she needs to focus on is becoming a chef. Hugging him is a sign of gratitude, she admits that she wouldn't know what to do if it wasn't for him. He wipes the tears off her cheek when she leans in and kisses him. Realizing what she's done, she pulls away and starts apologizing immediately. Confused, Pete gets up and asks whether he can call her in the morning. Returning to his apartment, he sits down and wonders what is wrong with him. The next morning, he is woken up by Rich and Luke. They remind him that they have to play basketball but Pete complains that his head hurts, so he can't come. Rich starts complaining about how it's basketball time and if he doesn't play basketball, his wife will try to have some her time as well. Pete finally agrees to come when a doorbell rings. Looking through the peephole, Pete sees Michelle so he goes out to talk to her in the hall. She apologizes for kissing him as it was a moment when she felt vulnerable. He is the only person she wanted to see being in such a bad state. He assures her that everything is fine and that he's there for her. Luke looks back at Rich in shock. He tells him that Michelle had given him an I want you hug while he gave her a pat on the back. He is immediately convinced that Pete is homosexual, and starts freaking out about it until Rich slaps it out of him. On the way to the basketball court, Rich and Luke try to convince Pete that all Michelle needed the previous night was intimacy, and he didn't give her any. Pete claims that all she needed was kindness, and admits to not wanting to take advantage of her vulnerable state. Michelle sits with Nikki for a morning coffee when Nikki admits to believing that Pete is a serial killer. For her, it is unnatural how he has a small waist and how he observes Michelle every time he sees her. Michelle doesn't let her words get to her as she thinks that Pete is kind and genuine, and even claims that she feels safe when she's around him. She tells Nikki about the kiss but it further confirms her suspicion of him being a serial killer. The men arrive at the basketball court where they're met with three of their other friends. The game begins and the trio seems to be having a hard time scoring and keeping the ball. Although Rich and Luke are trying to score, Pete doesn't really know what he's doing. Unfortunately or fortunately, the ball hits Pete in the private area, rendering him unconscious. At the hospital, the doctor orders them to do all the scans and checks necessary, despite Pete being against them. Pulling his pants down, the doctor is surprised to see such small tickles and Pete gets ashamed about it. Luckily for Pete, he is about to receive the words he always wanted to hear. The doctor tells him that he has had a brain tumor for the last 10 years, which luckily, is benign. The tumor has stopped the development in his private parts, making him grow female hormones and not go through puberty. I have a brain tumor. That is awesome. He starts cheering, confusing the doctor. He is curious as to how the tumor would be removed and the doctor tells him that they can take it out through his nose. Later in the day, he calls Rich and Luke about what had happened. They didn't know about Pete's small testicles or the fact that he has never gotten an intimate reaction. Pete admits that he never told the doctors because he was afraid of them telling him that he would stay like that forever. His friends cheer for him finally becoming normal, so naturally, Luke advises him to play the sympathy card with Michelle. Thinking about his idea, Rich agrees that it could be the best closing line as Pete can say that he's only gotten an intimate reaction from Michelle. Pete warns them not to say anything to her before hanging up the call and getting into surgery. Before proceeding with the surgery, the doctor lets Pete know that the surgery will be short but he'll have to take a couple of weeks off work for the recovery. Pete goes to his parents' house for his recovery. We see his mother channeling the powers of the universe through crystals to help her son get better. After some time, he tries to get an intimate reaction by looking at erotic magazines but unfortunately, he doesn't. Rich and Luke visit him after a couple of days and Pete complains about feeling the same as he did, and doubting that the surgery had worked. They assure him that it will work, and when it does he will love the pleasure. After some jokes on Pete's behalf, Rich opens the door, and in comes a gorgeous tall woman. Montana is a professional st who has come to make Pete's wishes come true. Looking at the stunning woman in front of him, he asks Rich and Luke to leave, so he can spend some time with her alone. Despite her getting and dancing for him, Pete doesn't get an intimate reaction. Late at night, not being able to fall asleep, he tosses and turns before he gets a text from Michelle. He lies to her about being away for a family emergency, 
and promises to be back soon. The next morning, he is woken up by his mother calling him for breakfast. Going to the table, he is greeted with cheers and screams. Looking down, he realizes that he has gotten an intimate reaction, and gets embarrassed about it. However, he screams in joy after getting into his room. He immediately leaves his parents' house and heads to his apartment. Walking into the apartment, he sees a woman in her underwear and immediately realizes that Luke is responsible for it. He comes from behind the couch and admits to thinking that he wouldn't be back so soon. Pete asks them to leave and as they're leaving Luke notices the reaction he had and starts celebrating. Rushing to the bathroom, Pete searches for a lube-like cream so he can Not being able to find anything, he pours some alcohol on himself and does the job. He experiences his first wave of that everyone in the building hears. The next few days he spends pleasuring himself to the point of getting bored of it. Sitting at a cafe with his friends, he admits that he is excited about the whole thing as every day feels like a new realization. He finally admits that he wants to be with Michelle but is scared of her not being interested in him and having to have an with her. Pete is getting out of his apartment when Michelle comes from behind him. She excitedly tells him about going to Santa Barbara for a week for a program she got accepted into by the famous chef Bobby Flay. If she wins the program, she will be Bobby's sous chef in the new restaurant in Los Angeles. She thanks him for encouraging her and hugs him but Pete pulls away quickly as he gets an intimate reaction. She tries to stop him, but he promises to talk to her later in the evening as he claims that he's late. Arriving at the hospital, Pete gets prepared for his patients but doesn't know that his hormones will get in the way of his job. The first patient thinks he's a fury and he explains his intimate problems to Pete. Pete's mind goes somewhere else as he admits that diving into our animal instincts and petting something furry could be a major turn on. The man looks at him with a weird look and asks if he's hitting on him. Pete gets back to his senses and apologizes. The next patient doesn't help Pete's case either, as she graphically explains what she and her partner did the previous night. Not being able to take it anymore, he stops the session and lies about them not having any more time. However, the client reminds him that they have 35 more minutes and Pete realizes that he has a problem. Waking up the next morning, Pete looks at himself in horror in the mirror as nasty puberty pimples sit on his face. He goes out to buy some skincare products, but when he comes back he is greeted by Michelle and Nikki. Although he tries to speak to them with his back turned, he turns around and they're shocked to see him in such a state. He goes to the doctor with no appointment, desperate for some help. Complaining about being moody and aroused, he asks about a pill to slow down or make puberty go away. The doctor looks at him with a blank expression and tells him that there is no such pill. Late in the night, Pete gets a knock on the door and when he opens it he sees Michelle. He invites her to sit but she says that she's only there to say goodbye as she has to go to the cooking program the following day. He coldly replies with bye so she asks him why he's avoiding her. Not knowing how to put it in words, Pete asks her to talk about everything once she comes back, as he'll have enough time to prepare what he wants to say. After her first day, Michelle calls Pete through video call and he answers. Excitingly, he asks her about her first day and she claims that everything is great but can't stop talking about Bobby. Pete gets jealous immediately. Bobby can be heard in the background, so Pete wishes her a good night and hangs up the call in a hurry as his jealousy gets to him. Josh notices that he's jealous but Pete denies that he is. Pete's NPR interview with Norma finally happens but it doesn't go as planned. He is asked about the genesis of the book and Pete starts talking about the time-consuming aspect that intimacy plays in our lives when his voice breaks. He continues talking about how intimacy controls one's life when his voice breaks again. Norma suggests he takes a sip of water and he does, but that doesn't help as his voice breaks once again, and again. His voice goes out completely, so he yells the word out, making the situation even more awkward. Embarrassed, he goes to his parents' house after but they tell him that it's not a big deal. Despite them trying to explain some things about puberty to him, he gives them an attitude. James doesn't like it but Brenda lets Pete take it all out as he's her baby. I'm not a baby, I'm a full-grown man he angrily yells. He walks out of the room after having a tantrum, but his parents are not mad at him as they've been waiting for years for him to act out. Returning home, Pete sits on the couch looking through videos until he finds the one he likes. Right as he's about to start Michelle video chats him. She talks to him about the stressful day they've had and reveals that she has gotten into the finals. In celebration, Bobby had decided to prepare snacks for everybody, so Michelle took the chance to call Pete. However, the only thing he hears is that Michelle and Bobby are close, so he asks her whether she's going to spend some time with the sexy chef. She asks him if he's okay as she thinks that he sounds odd. Claiming that he is, he tries to keep his cool but lets it all out as Bobby calls Michelle to eat. He tells her not to call him back, to enjoy the wine with Bobby before slamming the laptop shut. The next morning, Pete goes with his friend to the basketball court once again. While walking there, Luke looks through his Tinder profile and admits to being obsessed with it. Rich turns to Pete and asks him to babysit his kids on the 22nd. Although Pete doesn't want to do it at first, he agrees after Rich mentions that it's his and his wife's anniversary. They want to have some romantic time alone, away from the kids. Arriving at the court, the trio is greeted by the other trio that played with them the last time. They start talking trash about them not paying despite losing. 
The tension rises, but when one of the men throws a basketball into Pete's private part, he loses it. Taking his shirt off, he screams that he's ready as he wants to show them that he can play basketball well. He lives up to his promises as he plays better than ever. Blocking the shot, he passively aggressively asks the guy to pass the ball or shoot. After going back and forth, the guy asks Pete what's wrong with him, and Pete threatens to show him his testicles and to even skin his face off. The man decides to leave and the rest of them go with him as well. Rich and Luke calm Pete down but he doesn't stop with the attitude. Returning to the building, he is met by Josh, who tells him that he smells bad. They get inside the apartment, and Josh tells Pete all about Becky. She is texting Josh while being in a relationship. Pete feels with what Josh is going through as he claims that girls will be girls. You try to be the nice guy and then some things get in the way. Hormones, testosterone, mood swings, and reactions. Josh agrees with it and even admits to playing at school. They go out for dinner where they continue their conversation about girls. Josh admits to wanting to hate Becky Adams but not being able to as he wants to ask her for the spring fling. School dances are designed to make the 10 popular kids from school happy, while the rest of the kids are miserable, according to Pete. Josh asks whether Michelle is Pete's Becky, and he gets defensive about it as he claims that he will ask Michelle out once she comes back. He can't help but mention Bobby as he calls him bad names. Josh laughs but Pete asks him not to laugh as he admits to having possessive urges that he can't control. They are not based on any logic and are very confusing to him. Josh being the actual teenager between them agrees with Pete but is fascinated by how Pete is the only one that understands him. He is curious as to how Pete deals with women, but Pete admits to not dating much. Josh is shocked and claims that he can have any girl in the state he is in. He has a car and apartment and is financially stable. The little man thinks that most people Pete's age have been with a lot of people and even accuses Michelle of sleeping with tons of people. Pete tries defending her but Josh proves him wrong with his statistics. Assuming that she peaked in high school with one boyfriend, he believes that she had up to three boyfriends in college. And there's a period of post-college when a girl has to find her way, so Josh assumes that she's had a minimum of ten boyfriends, plus Charlie being the newest one. Claiming that it would only be reasonable to know your way around a woman's body, Josh convinces Pete to gain some experience before she comes back. You should never take advice from a kid, but I wouldn't say that Pete thinks the same as he goes home and immediately puts himself out into the dating world. Swiping on almost every woman that pops up on Tinder, he hopes that he finds someone to teach him. His first date is a picnic with a beautiful woman who has The obsession with Tinder is real, as we see Pete doing everyday activities with his phone and his HM swiping left and right. The obsession with having experience gets to him as he starts using his patience to vent to them. The intimacy addicts that come to him start relating to his stories, but Pete doesn't seem to realize that he's becoming one of them. Before he enters his apartment, he sees Charlie waiting by her door. He lets him know that she's not home and doesn't know when she'll be back. Charlie asks him for some information but Pete claims that he doesn't know anything. Charlie admits to his mistake and claims to miss Michelle. Before leaving, Charlie asks Pete to let Michelle know that he had been there and the flowers are from him. Pete promises to do so, despite not wanting to. Later in the night, he's working on his new book when someone rings his door. Opening the door, he sees Michelle in front of him with the bouquet in her hands. She asks if the flowers are from him and since the card is not signed, Pete lies about him sending the flowers. She invites him to the apartment, so he takes the chance to finally invite her to go on a date. Struggling at first he asks her about the time spent in Santa Barbara, but then he redeems himself by asking her to talk about Santa Barbara over dinner. They settle on meeting in an hour and as Pete's getting ready, he gets a call from Rich. He asks him where he is and reminds him that it's the 22nd. Pete admits to completely having forgotten about babysitting but Rich asks him to come immediately. Upset, he asks Rich to postpone their anniversary as he thinks he only gets one shot with Michelle. Rich reminds him that anniversaries can't be changed and that he can take her out some other time. Pete claims that he will do something for himself once and decides not to help his friend out. Josh comes over as his moral support and lets him know that he is in the right. Again, you should never take advice from a teenager, but Pete doesn't realize that as he listens to everything Josh has to say. For instance, Josh tells him to be very rude on the date as he claims that it would attract her more. They finally go to dinner at a fancy restaurant, and as they sit down Pete's attitude is different. As the date progresses, Pete forgets all about his bad boy persona, but once Michelle mentions Bobby he loses it once again. He calls him an alcoholic because Michelle mentions that the man has a wine cellar. However, she continues to talk about him and he cuts her off, saying that he understands that she had a good time with Bobby. She asks him whether he's jealous, and he says that he's rather concerned. Bobby wouldn't even be mentioned if Michelle slept with him, so she says. But, Pete tells her that she's single and she can do whatever she wants. She asks him why he's being so rude and that is when it hits him. Coming to the realization, he apologizes for being a douche and admits to being nervous because going on a date with her is something that he always wanted. She lets him know that there's nothing he needs to worry about and they start over. Just as things seem to be better, Rich storms in with his wife and reveals that Pete had stolen their table reservation. Michelle is shocked and heartbroken that Pete could do something like that. 
Rich and Pete argue but things escalate once Pete challenges Rich to a fight. Michelle walks out of the restaurant and Pete goes after her. He asks for a chance to explain himself but she tells him that he sounds like Charlie. She also reveals that she knows the flowers weren't from him. Things seem to be going bad for Pete as he gets in trouble at work as well. A patient with comes to his office and graphically explains how she wants to play. Letting his imagination rule him, he falls for the trap. She starts screaming at him and calls him to her office immediately. Being sent home, he asks his boss whether he can call her to discuss the issue, and she lets him know that they have to wait and see whether the patient will file a lawsuit. Pete spends his whole day alone until he finally goes to his parents' house in the evening. Sitting down with his father while enjoying a cold beer, he admits to not being able to control his late puberty. His father being supportive, lets him know that most guys can't control themselves either. Puberty is something that happens to guys at an early age and never ends. James shares a story with his son, the time he was on a business trip in Miami was the time he was at a motel at the airport. Brenda had kicked him out for him being unfaithful to his colleague. James regretted it from the start, but it made him realize that the biggest change he went through is discovering the difference between acting like a man and being a man. Tears fill Pete's eyes as he asks his father whether he's embarrassed by him. James gets saddened by the question but admits to having never been and never will be embarrassed by his son. He claims to have known that something might have been off, but Pete is his son and there's nothing more important than that. His father's kind words give him strength and motivation for the Ned talk. We see Pete on stage, confidently talking about how intimacy is all around us. People spend almost two months combined thinking about intimacy out of the whole year. He lets everyone know that intimate energy can be altered and diverted before stopping and laughing his butt off. Pulling himself together, he admits that there are flaws in the theories he had written. The crowd looks at him weirdly and so does his boss backstage. Pete admits to not getting intimate for the last 15 years of his life, and while he has done a lot of cool stuff in his life, he has missed the cool things about intimacy. He speaks freely as he admits that intimacy is amazing. It's about two people coming together, which can also make it terrifying but beautiful. He finishes the speech by telling people to get intimate more often and to go crazy with it as long as it's consensual. Trying to do things right, Pete goes to Rich's daughter's birthday party ready to apologize. He does so and the couple lets him know that it's fine because they know what he's going through. After the party's over, Rich, his wife, Pate, and Luke sit in the backyard. Pete lets them know that Michelle had gone back to Charlie and he doesn't blame her for it. Luke, on the other hand, thinks that they were great for each other. He wishes to have something as they do or something like Rich and his wife. Rich asks him about his Tinder date but Luke claims that he wants something real and raw. Rich's wife lets Pete know that Michelle had won the first prize and the restaurant will be opening that same week. But Pete claims that she doesn't want to see him, so there's no point in him going. However, the weekend comes and Pete can be seen storming into the restaurant with Rich and Luke by his side. Right as Charlie is trying Michelle's soup and complaining that it's cold, Pate walks in and plays a mix of songs he had prepared for the opening of her restaurant. Michelle runs up to him and asks him to turn off the song and stop embarrassing her in the restaurant. He asks her to hear him out and she tells him that she doesn't want to as she's already moved on with Charlie. Heartbroken, Pete returns to his friends but they claim not to let him leave the restaurant until he tells her everything. Understanding what he's supposed to do, Pete goes back and reveals the truth. He mentions puberty, the tumor, the hormones, and the large amount of testosterone that hit him at once. He admits that the date they went to made him realize that he didn't know how to be a man, but asks for a chance to find himself while being with her. Charlie stands up and asks what's going on. Michelle admits that she's confused but the situation has raised a bigger question. She lets Charlie know that she doesn't see him in her life now that she's becoming a chef, and surprisingly he leaves the restaurant peacefully. Turning to Pete, she lets him know that she gets off at midnight and asks for them to talk. Not wanting to wait until midnight, he tries to get a table but Bobby tells him that there's none available. Being impatient, he grabs Michelle and kisses her passionately. Everyone around them cheers as they enjoy another kiss. We are taken a couple of years later where we see Pete at his book signing, along with his parents and a pregnant Michelle. It seems like his former boss hasn't forgotten about him either as she tries to convince his young fans that if it wasn't for her, he would have been nothing. Although you can tell that Pete is a star, she claims to have been the only one that saw that in him. It was his talent but her ability to make him who he has become. By the time she explains everything, the poor child seems to not even want to be there anymore. A teenager comes to get his book signed and complains to Pete about his parents. He calls them annoying and non-understanding. Pete lets him know that he gets his struggles. Parents stink and they will never get it. James and Brenda chime in from the side but Pete reminds them that he's okay and happy at the moment. His father reminds him that he is about to have a child and that he will be the stinking parent. Michelle chimes in and claims that Pete will be the stinking parent while she'll be the best mother in the world. Pete has finally realized his dream, written the book he always wanted to write, and gotten the girl of his dreams. For the first time in his life, he doesn't feel lost or like there's something wrong with him. 